Hello, my name is Andres Fernandez. I'm Senior Director of Silicon Engineering at Twist Bioscience. For many years now, there has been growing interest in using DNA to store digital information. First, because it was really cool to imagine using nature's data storage method, but now because it can address a real need. The ability to synthesize DNA is not new. What is new is the ability to do it on a large enough scale that using it to store information becomes practical. The title of my talk is From DNA Synthesis on Chips to DNA Data Storage. Let me start by giving a brief introduction to TWIST. Our breakthrough centers on the ability to synthesize DNA on silicon chips. We have built a platform that allows us to synthesize high quality DNA in a massively parallel fashion. We like to say that we have precision at scale. Initially, we developed products to support two related fields, synthetic biology and next generation sequencing. Now, we are now developing products for the biopharma field, supporting diagnostic and therapeutic applications. Overall, we like to say that with our DNA synthesis platform, we are powering the new bioeconomy. We are now turning our attention to data storage. We want to be part of a growing group of companies that are actively planning the deployment of DNA data storage. I note that a data storage alliance has formed and they will work towards a general specification that will lead to a standard. This is how DNA data storage works. The process has six basic steps. First, binary data is mapped into a series of four unique bases, A, G, C, T. Then the data is coded and split into small strands of DNA and an index is added to each strand. Next, the DNA strands are written using a DNA synthesizer. The DNA strands are then harvested and stored in a hermetically sealed capsule. When someone wants to retrieve the information, the capsule is opened and the DNA inside is removed. The DNA is then read using a DNA sequencer. Finally, the sequence data is decoded back to binary form. This contrasts with other storage technologies in that the read and write functions are performed on separate instruments. The DNA, the DNA data storage is more modular in this regard. And the format that is used is fixed by nature. What makes DNA data storage so attractive is summarized in this slide. First, it is extremely compact, so you can store a lot of data in a small container. Second, DNA has longevity. Because double-stranded DNA is such a stable molecule, it has the projected lifetime of a thousand plus years without needing data migration. Obviously, we did not measure this directly, but inferred it from accelerated aging tests using the Arrhenius method. The degradation mechanism is basically oxidation. So hermetic storage solves the problem. Third, the power requirements are low. During storage, there is zero power consumption. There are no special storage requirements other than don't bake it, which applies to most storage technologies. Lastly, it has strong data resilience. Error correction codes embedded in the data ensure a low bit error rate. This slide highlights how DNA data storage matches up against other storage technologies in various dimensions. First, DNA data storage has the low, lowest total cost of ownership for archival storage applications. We based this assertion on a model adopted by Fujifilm via IBM and extended to include DNA-based approaches. The lack of data migration is the principal reason for DNA data storage is low TCO. In addition, making copies of DNA is extremely inexpensive 
and you can store the data in any size packets that fit the application. Reading and writing data in DNA does take longer than other storage technologies, but for archival storage, this shouldn't pose much of a barrier. To realize this low TCO, it will be necessary to vastly increase the scale of synthesizing DNA to reduce the cost. To accomplish this, the logical approach is to take advantage of Moore's law and use semiconductor chips. Specifically, we will use CMOS chips coupled with electrochemistry to synthesize DNA in a massively parallel fashion. This well-established approach is illustrated here. First, you start with a chip that has a large array of electrochemical devices patterned on top of a CMOS chip. Each device is individually addressable via the CMOS circuitry. You then couple one of four DNA bases onto the chip surface. Only one base can couple at a time because the bases are capped with a blocking group at the end. After coupling, you oxidize the base to strengthen the bond. Next, you actuate a selected number of devices with voltage. And by doing so, you locally generate acid electrochemically. This acid results in the removal of the blocking group. Once removed, the coupling process is repeated with the next base. By cycling through this process, you can grow uniquely sequenced DNA strands at each pixel in the array. It is instructive to take a look, a closer look at the DNA strands and what it means to write one terabyte of data in DNA. Shown at the bottom is a representative strand of DNA, which we typically refer to as an oligo. A typical oligo is comprised of a 200 base sequence. Now, not all of the bases store data. 20 bases at each end are primer sequences needed for DNA amplification to make copies and to enable searching to give granularity to the data and 20 more bases are needed for indexing each strand relative to the other strands. So what is left, 140 bases, is the payload that carries the data. To write one terabyte of data, you need 50 billion unique oligos if each oligo holds 20 bytes of data. It is important to point out that each of these unique oligos is not a single molecule. At each device on the chip, a thousand copies of each strand are produced. This provides a good deal of redundancy. Importantly, the oligos don't remain on the chip. They are washed off and placed in a container. After freeze drying, the volume that the DNA occupies is about 150 microns cubed, or about the size of a third of a grain of salt. And that grain contains one terabyte of data with a thousand-fold redundancy built in. While the magnitude of the molecules seems fantastic, it is only because the molecules are loose as opposed to patterned on a disk or a multi-level NAND chip. In genomics, large numbers of molecules are the norm. The CMOS chips are incorporated into a synthesis system, which I describe here. Because the synthesis process is performed with wet chemistry, the chips are mounted into a flow cell. On the top right is a top view of the flow cell, and on the bottom is a side view. Fluids enter a manifold on the left side, and then uniformly pass over the chip and exit out of a manifold on the right. We plan on evolving such a system over several generations. In the top chart are listed the main characteristics of the chip for each generation. The end goal is to achieve one terabyte of data per chip per run. With a projected chip size of four by three centimeters, we will generate three billion oligos in gen one and increasing to 50 billion by the third generation.
At the same time, we will be upgrading the fluidics as shown in the bottom chart. In Gen 1, we will incorporate eight chips per system, and this will grow to 32 and then 128 by Gen 3. The system capacity will scale from one terabyte per run to 120 terabytes per run by Gen 3. This type of system may seem foreign to you, but it really isn't. Think of inkjet printers with ink cartridges and fluid delivery, and then you can start to envision how familiar such a system might start to look, except that it will be rack mountable. Let me next turn to the subject of cost for DNA synthesis. Over and over, I hear that DNA synthesis is too expensive. I must point out that the reason is that there is no driving force to reduce the cost. For our synthetic biology and NGS business, the COGS is low enough for us to profit. If one looks at the cost structure for DNA storage, however, we must drastically reduce the COGS to be competitive with other technologies. Like most things, the COGS breaks down into fixed and variable costs. Fixed costs include the system and the chips, while the variable costs are primarily the cost of reagents. As we greatly scale up the number of oligos synthesized per chip, both the fixed and the variable costs will dramatically be reduced. Density is the biggest knob we can turn here, but there are other factors as well. To reduce the depreciated system cost, we can reduce the cycle time for the reactions to boost the number of synthesis runs per, per day. This could potentially net a 4x cost reduction, for example. To reduce the chip cost, we can reuse the chips. As I explained earlier, the DNA is extracted after each run, and this allows us the opportunity to wash the chips and reuse them in, sub in a subsequent run. To reduce reagent costs, we will push on the supply chain and recycle reagents. Overall, it is an exercise in miniaturization, basically decreasing the volume per reaction. There are a few other cost elements worth mentioning. First, the DNA needs to be stored in a hermetically sealed capsule. A solution already exists for this in the market. A company called Imaging sells metal capsules that are sealed with a laser welding process for this exact application. Second, sequencing also adds to the overall cost, but not as much as you might think. For archival storage, we expect to write often and read seldom. So the amount of DNA sequencing needed should be a fraction of the data that is written. But nevertheless, we, we do need to consider it. We feel that a chip-based molecular sequencing, ap sequencing approach will provide the same level of scaling required to bring the cost down. There are many companies working on this low-cost solution. Incidentally, a chip-based approach for sequencing will also benefit from a chip reuse strategy. This slide outlines a typical development process. It will go from technology development to system development, to incorporating a quality management system, and then to shipping products. We emphasize the QMS bullet because we realize that we need to build a bulletproof system if this is to be widely deployed. The question keeps coming up about system reliability, especially since it is a wet chemical process. The point of a quality system provides a means to manage processes with QC at each step as well as a continuous improvement for the overall process. We are considering two options to productize DNA data storage. One option is to sell an end-to-end -end system so that the customer has full ownership of the writing, storage, and reading processes. The second option is to synthesize and sequence as a service. With this option, we would store the DNA in a catalog bank of capsules until such time that the customer wished to retrieve their data. To summarize, DNA is a high performance storage solution. DNA is robust when properly stored. Multiple copies are produced during the right process. 
and copies are easily made. DNA data storage is coming sooner than you think. A proof of concept system is imminent and a production system will soon follow. This is just the beginning. The 21st century will see amazing things to come, come to life and DNA will lead the way. Thank you.